Welcome back to ChessOpenings.com. Today's video is all about the Karo Khan opening, which begins with the moves pawn to e4 and pawn to c6. And with this signature move, pawn to c6 in the Karo Khan, black is aiming to disturb white's central situation with the move d5 and also set up a stronghold for himself in the center. In the Karo Khan, black also tends to avoid a lot of weaknesses, and this gives him a solid position which he can rely upon. Let's take a look. After the moves pawn to e4 and pawn to c6, black quickly disturbs the central situation with the move d5, and this happens after the almost universally played moves pawn to d4 and pawn to d5. And it's with this move that black sets up a direct threat against the e4 pawn in this position, and this forces white to clarify the central situation. Now, one of white's options is to simply defend the pawn on e4, and he can do this usually with the move knight to c3. Knight d2 would also be an option which tends to lead to the similar situation. Another option for white in this position is to capture on d5 and then play c4, and this is known as the Panoff Botvinnik attack. But today we're going to look at what's called the advanced variation, in which white simply advances the pawn forward to e5. And it's this variation that allows white to deal with the threat to e4 and also snatch some extra space in the meantime. And in theory, this is an excellent idea for white. However, unlike, say, the French defense where black would have played an early pawn to e6 move, black now profits from his chance to develop the light squared bishop outside of the pawn chain with the move bishop f5 before playing this move pawn to e6. And now we reach an incredibly interesting situation. White has gained this far advanced e5 pawn, and this allows him to keep black's development somewhat confused. For example, we'll notice that the knight on g8 is lacking its most natural square on f6. To give some more example of this, let's look at the very popular moves, knight to f3, pawn to e6, bishop to e2. And now notice the ease with which white has developed his kingside pieces to logical squares. Now also notice that black doesn't enjoy quite the same freedom. Since this pawn on e5 is taking away squares on f6 and d6, perhaps the knight would like to go to f6, the bishop would like to go to d6, but both pieces are lacking these squares. In fact, both pieces would like to move to e7 in this position, but of course the rules of chess simply don't permit this. So black must be very clever about how to deploy the pieces in this position. And as is so often the case in these situations where white has a fixed pawn chain on d4 and e5, black's main method of seeking counterplay is to achieve the c5 advance, and he can do that right away. Another method which he can use is to prepare this advance with knight d7 first, but to really understand the pros and cons of the Karo Khan, we're going to start by looking at this situation after black plays an immediate c5. Now, this pawn break achieves a couple of important aims. The very first thing it does is to put pressure on white center, and it also provides a useful square for the knight on c6. But to understand this position more clearly, let's discuss what happens after the natural move pawn to c3. In fact, this move is not very popular, and we'll see why by making a comparison to the French defense, because as it turns out, the exact same pawn structure in the center could have also arisen from the French defense. Let's take a look at that after the moves pawn to e4, pawn to e6, which is the French defense, pawn to d4, pawn to d5, e5, c5, c3, and just this basic moves knight c6 and knight f3. There are two key differences between this position. In the Karo Khan, black had managed to bring his bishop out to the f5 square. This is more likely to be a benefit rather than a downside, since even if the bishop is harassed and eventually traded, that tends to be a better situation for black than having the bishop stuck on c8 as it is in this position. I also want to point out that in this position, the poor placement of black's light squared bishop impacts the other pieces. For example, by making it somewhat more difficult to bring this rook on a8 into the game, since it would probably like this square on c8. However, there's one very important downside in the Karo Khan move order. After the moves pawn to e4, pawn to c6, d4, d5, e5, bishop f5, all these moves that we've seen before, knight f3, pawn to e6, bishop e2, 
and now this move pawn to c5. The downside here is that black has taken not one, but two tempi in order to bring the pawn to c5. With his very first move in the opening, he did play the move pawn to c6, and while this did allow him to bring the bishop out, it also made him use an extra tempo bringing the pawn to c5. Now, if the position remains closed, this is unlikely to be a major factor. And this is why after the move pawn to c3, black has no problems achieving a very comfortable position. He continues now knight to c6, now castles kingside. And now black needs to solve this problem about bringing out the kingside pieces. And in order to do this, he first plays c takes d4, c takes d4, and now knight gd e7. And notice that at the moment, there's no longer a pawn hanging on c5, thanks to the capture on d4. And black's idea here is simply to make use of this available c8 square. In the French defense, we would not have the c8 square so available for maneuvering since the bishop would be stuck on that square. But in these positions, black uses the c8 square as a pivot point for his pieces. So after the move knight to c3, black now simply plays knight to c8, planning to bring that knight to b6 later on. And now after bishop e3, he completes his kingside development. Bishop e7, rook c1, castles kingside, and black is in excellent shape. He's getting ready to play the moves knight b6, rook c8, perhaps maybe queen d7, and black has no real problems here. Despite the fact that white has kept a slight space advantage, white has not managed to create any real confusion for the black pieces, and it's for this reason that black has very little to fear in this position. So, by studying these details, we've come to understand some of black's major aspirations in the Karakon. However, white can probably improve upon the plan associated with pawn to c3. Instead, white should try to capitalize on the unique factors of the position, including not only his extra tempo, but also the fact that he has not yet committed to playing pawn to c3. And I think it's because of these factors that modern masters have preferred to aim for breaks not with pawn to c3, but with pawn to c4 at a later time in these positions. The best example of this kind of plan occurs after the very strong move bishop to e3, and the idea here is to bait black into taking on d4 by putting pressure on this c5 pawn. And in fact, black quite often does take now. Pawn takes pawn on d4, and now after knight takes d4, white is gaining an outpost for that knight, and he's also starting to harass that bishop that we were once taking pride in in this position. In fact, in this position, white is starting to develop quite a scary looking development advantage. Black has first of all moved the pawn to c6, then to c5, then he's actually taken on d4, bringing a knight out to the center for white. And this position is not too bad for black, however, he does have to be very careful. For example, the simple move bishop to g6 actually turns out to be a mistake in this position. White first of all plays a preparatory castling kingside. And now, after the move knight g to e7, scrambling to finish development and perhaps supporting the move knight b to c6, in fact, white is ready to start trying to open up the game with a very strong move pawn to c4. And now, black tends to play knight b c6, and it looks like he's starting an attack on e5, but in fact, white has another excellent move, knight to c3, and it turns out that it's not white center, but black center, which is being laid under siege here, and black ends up just too far behind in development. This position is very favorable for white, and I want to show, for example, just how dangerous white's attack is after the move knight takes e5, which looks like it may pick up a pawn, but in fact there are a variety of moves here which allow white to accumulate an overwhelming advantage thanks to his extra development. I think the simplest move here is simply pawn takes pawn in the center, and you'll find that every single capture in this position is actually quite bad for black. If he takes with the pawn, white would simply play the move f4, and now black would have to spend a move with the knight, and white is getting ready to play f5. So for example, let's play knight c4 attacking the bishop on e3, and certainly white would take on c4, and now he would play f5, and the bishop on g6 finds itself trapped. And in fact, there's no way to avoid losing a piece in this position, and so there is no way to take the pawn on d5. Of course, the same situation would occur if black would take with the knight and then with the pawn. Once again, 
white would simply play f4, and it turns out that this bishop on g6 will be lost. And thirdly, black could now recapture with the queen, but after the simple check on a4, it turns out that black is just way too far behind in development. If he just continues with, say, knight to c6, he always needs to count on simply moves like any rook bringing itself to d1, or bishop to f3, or both moves combined, and black's gonna find himself just under tremendous pressure, which is in fact a lost position for black. So in fact, in this position, bishop g6 is probably just a mistake, and players handling the black places have largely preferred the move knight to e7. Now, in this position, taking on f5 is actually not that grand of an idea, since despite gaining the bishop pair, white has given black serious time for the comfortable development of his pieces. He's now already found an ideal post for the knight on f5, and he's attacking this bishop with tempo, so there's just no good reason to take on f5. Instead, white should choose between either the immediate c4, or he can choose to build this up with the move knight d2 followed by c4, and we'll just quickly take a look at this. For example, play often continues knight to c6, and now an interesting move here, knight 2 to f3, holding on to the e5 pawn in this case. When white maintains this pawn, and he still has this chance of breaking with c2 to c4. Now, all in all, these positions seem to offer white a tiny or slight advantage, but black's position is rock solid. With good knowledge of the positions which arise, black can count on a position without many weaknesses. And as you've seen, there's so much back and forth going on here. For example, white could have played c3 instead of knowing about this bishop e3 plan. And so there are so many subtle points that you can catch white with here that there are excellent reasons to still consider this as an excellent defense for black. That's all for today. The Karakhan is a very solid opening for black. Today, we've looked at some of the key ideas in the advanced variation. I hope you've enjoyed this brief tour and gotten some insight into the key ideas and key struggles which characterize the Karakhan opening. That's it for today, and I look forward to seeing you again.